Welcome again. So uh, please mute, mute yourself during this meeting. Um, and uh, if you have questions, uh, ask your questions through the chat, yeah? And uh, enter your name and your country and then your question, yeah? And thank you again for your attention. On the agenda for today, we uh, have to welcome you. So once again, yeah? And then we will discuss a rubric and we will give some lectures on the topic of the assignment of today. Yeah, and then uh, after the lectures, we will explain or give some more explanation on the, um, the assignments the students have to do uh, for December. Yeah. So, uh, Nick, I cannot see the chat. Uh, if you are able to have an overview, if somebody is uh, questioning something. Okay. So, uh, on the creating rubric, uh, I, tell, I already told you that uh, Pratama, who is here, and uh, myself um, developed the grading rubric, but Pratama um, made a demo. Yeah, I will um, show you the demo, and afterwards Pratama will explain some more on the rubric. So, just share the demo. I have to share it with computer sounds, if some are safe. Okay, so let's listen to the rubric you made. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Pratama. I'm from Universitas Gajah Mada, Indonesia. Uh, we'll be explaining to you about the use of uh, I-STEP grading rubric for uh, grading students' work uh, throughout the international uh, student exchange program of TOF. So uh, all of the tutors will be provided this file. We'll put this Excel file or Excel, Excel spreadsheet uh, as a Google Sheet uh, that could be available for you. Uh, so in this uh, file, uh, you will find uh, several sheets. I put the names of student A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and J. Uh, you can rename them based on the name of the student in your group. Uh, I put 10 sheets here. You can add more if you need or delete some that you don't need. Uh, so it will be depends on the number of students of each group that you have. So in each sheet, uh, it will reflect the marks of its students. So I will give example uh, an explanation for uh, one sheet and you later it could be duplicated and done in a similar way to all other sheets. So please put the name of the student here and then type the group name and also type your name as the tutor. This grading rubric consists of 10 items. There will be eight assignments, assignment one, two, three, four, five, etc. to assignment eight. And then there is an interprofessional collaborative practice competency and international competencies. Those are the um, aspects or creating aspects that uh, involve numbers. There is also general feedback at the end of the uh, rubric and also uh, qualitative comments uh, in each part or each aspect to be created. So I will explain uh, for the assignments first. So we try to make a generic uh, grading aspects for each assignment to ensure that uh, we are not limiting students' creativity and students' idea. However, we put detailed scoring rubric here to make sure that the judgment and the marking done by uh, the tutors uh, is actually robust and objective. As you can see here, uh, there, there are four, five uh, aspects to be created in each assignment, uh, incorporating uh, content quality, critical thinking, evidence-based format and layout, and also adherence. The maximum score of quantum quality will be three. 
Practical thinking three, evidence base will be two, format and layout and also utterance will be one. So the total maximum score will be ten for each assignment. Uh, please uh, create uh, your students' work for each assignment based on these rubrics. So, for example, if the student uh, put relevant questions or uh, put answers uh, that there are relevant uh, to the questions, use academic language appropriately, arguments based on the literature, and also show adequate business effort, you can put three mark here. For example, this one. For example, when we are feeling that the uh, uh, critical thinking is shallow, uh, not that adequate, so we can put one here. This is for example. So this part is actually where you put the mark. This is to show on uh, the maximum score that available for its number. If you fill them uh, and then later it will be automatically uh, uh, summing your uh, marks and it will be, it will be uh, showing the final mark of each assignment. Since uh, there are 10 aspects with each uh, maximum score of 10, the maximum score of all uh, assignments and, uh, and assessment will be 100. So as you can see here, uh, this is the uh, column that shows students' achievement. And this is the maximum achievement that could be uh, achieved by the student. Uh, this explanation apply for assignment one until assignment eight. And the, uh, there are two other aspects to be assessed here, uh, which are the interprofessional collaborative practice competencies and also international competencies. Uh, those two aspects actually uh, mark as a general. Uh, usually, it should be marked later uh, by the end of the uh, by the end of the uh, exchange activity. So this is uh, like an overall mark for them. It includes values of ethics for interprofessional practice, roles and responsibilities, interprofessional communication, and teamwork. For the international competencies, it would be language skills, global engagement, personal growth international disciplinary learning, and also intercultural competences. Those are the rubric for those each uh, creating aspect. Beside the marks or the scores, we also incorporate uh, all, uh, general feedback here. So please, uh, tutors are encouraged to provide general qualitative feedback by the end of uh, this rubric because it will be very useful for the students to enhance their learning and also to develop themselves uh, better and more in depth. Uh, you are also invited to comment in each uh, columns in these comments if you want to put some uh, encouragement or you want to put some feedback for each assignment, it will be very great for the students. I think that's all for this explanation. Uh, should you have any questions regarding this rubric, please send queries or send your email to my address at pratama.santoso.utomo at ugm.ac.it. Thank you very much for your cooperation, and we wish you a, a nice facilitating and also discussion, interaction with all of the students during this I-STEP program in 2020 and 2021. Thank you very much. Topic, thank you, Pratama. Do you want to add something more on your demo or? Uh, yeah, thank you, Tony. I think uh, that's all because the demo, I think, explained everything. But should you have any questions regarding the marking rubric, uh, uh, you are really welcome to send me an email. So later, uh, the file will be provided to you uh, as a Google Sheet, maybe. Uh, and then later, we will give you access uh, for each group. Uh, as this is for the tutors. And for the students, we will also give you the rubric. And so you can see uh, what are expected uh, uh, 
to be created by the tutors in its assignment and uh, other aspects. So uh, it's fair that you know what to be assessed. Uh, so it, it should be fair for everyone. Assessment should be fair for everyone. We are not, we don't want to uh, make any of you lose something, but we want to all of us to be learning together. So uh, regarding the, uh, uh, the Google sheet, uh, we are still discussing with Raymond whether it should be done by Tuff or it should it could be done by me later. So only we will discuss about this uh, about the mechanism of the access. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pratama. So for everybody, the main message is that students will be evaluated on three main ingredients: yeah, uh, on the professional, on the intercultural, yeah, and then some general aspects uh, on the assignment will be uh, graded. Yeah, um, and it's also very interesting, as Pastor already said, for students when they make the assignment to to look to this video or to look to the grading um, uh, on how uh, we will look at your assignment. Yeah, so that's always very helpful and uh, useful to know. Well, well, I was you have a, a question from Katie from the USA: Is how, if at all, do we include the group meetings into the grade? Some students may not have reliable internet. Please, what, what do you say, Nicolas? The question is how, if at all, do we include the group meetings into the grade? Some students may not ha have reliable internet. That's from Katie, Katie Harmony in, in the chat. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think the most of the grading is based on the assignment. Yeah, and I think um, the main idea is to um, attend as most as possible the, the small group meetings yeah, and to attend the discussions. Yeah, so um, I will look it up uh, for last year and we will also um, give an idea on how many times we expect students to uh, attend the meetings yeah, um, before. Uh, not getting a grade and not uh, being successful in this uh, program at the end. Okay. So I will share my system. There is another question, uh, Tony. What about late submission? So, uh, uh, Noha, uh, as you can see in the rubric later, uh, there is an aspect what we call adherence is related to the submission. If it's late, then the adherence score might be deducted. I think. Later, uh, we will share you uh, because it, it means that it, it's a serious, whether the students are serious or not, uh, it's related to the submission. But I, we really understand the connection might not be good in, it, in some countries or in some areas so that uh, we don't put the attendance as uh, part of the mark, but we actually uh, encourage all of students to attend uh, as, uh, as many sessions as possible. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So share my screen again and continue. Um, so we ended with this PowerPoint. Yeah. So uh, we will add the link to the demo underneath this watch this video sign. Yeah. So you can find it easily and you will receive a PDF of this PowerPoint presentation after this meeting. Yeah. So we send it to all the students. Uh, who are involved in the ISA program and also to all the tutors who are guiding the students. So everybody is aware of what we expect and, and how we want to proceed with the program. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so um, you know that we have chosen to focus on the topics of the WHO concerning the social determinants of health, and we know that the WHO stated some key concepts of those uh, social determinants of health who needed some special attention. Yeah, so the last assignment was on the, uh, the first assignment and the last also was on the community walk. So we, we asked you to go into the community and to uh, make some kind of overview um, on how the community looked based on a model uh, of the social determinants of health. Yeah. So we 
we focused on the second uh, assignment. On uh, we will focus on the during the second assignment for the employment conditions, yeah, and how the employment conditions are related to uh, social determinants of health, yeah. And actually, at the end, you will know something more, yeah? some more practical information on the assignment. But actually, we want you to look yeah, in your own community on the social uh, on the employment conditions and how they are related to social determinants of health. Yeah? So if you want to know more, yeah, in the previous PowerPoint, yeah, we have already gave an overview of where you can find the course, the theoretical uh, um, the course from the WHO. We use the framework, yeah, and this is again the link yeah, you can use to have access to more information on, for example, this assignment, the employment condition. So this is again an overview of the different assignments. Uh, assignment two is of uh, the employment conditions. I already told it to you. Yeah, and then uh, we have no guests to give a lecture today. Yeah, uh, but we expect some kind of. Oh yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, we expect some kind of um, video from uh, Robert Woolard, who is a, com uh, a medicine in the community. And he will um, talk about his experiences and how um, community work as a medicine is uh, related to the um, social determinants of health. Yeah, but we also have two experts who gave already a lecture uh, for the network. Yeah, and we implemented those two experts in this session. Yeah, uh, the first video we want to show you is from uh, Arthur Kaufman. Yeah, he's a real expert on the social determinants of health. He's a wonderful man who knows a lot of those uh, top, this topic. Yeah, and he gave a lecture on changing the health workforce paradigm, yeah, the role of a community healthcare worker in healthcare. Yeah, so let's look to this video. Um, sorry, sorry, before we start, I see another question in the chat. Yes. Um, uh, can we do the class? And in discussion in Zoom meeting, maybe the person who uh, said it can elaborate a bit more on what they meant. You want to, to do what? The class in the Zoom meeting? Yeah, that's what the question says, but maybe the person can uh, say it again okay. in a different way. Who asked this question? Just I am sorry, I'm very much mispronouncing your name. Okay, just to start sorry. answering already, um, normally we organize the small group meetings and the big group meetings with Zoom. Yeah, so the big group meetings are scheduled by the network, so you receive an by the network, you just have to accept it. And we know now that a lot of those invitations uh, end in to your junk mail. Yeah? So please, if you don't receive an, uh, an invitation, look into your junk. Yeah. Uh, and when you accept this invitation of the network, uh, it will be added in your Outlook agenda. So if you have an Outlook agenda, it's very easy. Yeah. For the small groups uh, meetings, we cannot uh, organize uh, Zoom meetings. Yeah, and it's the tutor of your teacher who will guide your team that organizes the meetings. Yeah, and we agree that you can organize the meetings in a way you like the most. Yeah, so a lot of students and tutors use Zoom. Yeah, but uh, I think we also have uh, tutors from my university college who use Blackboard Collaborate. Yeah, uh, maybe also through WhatsApp, yeah, even through Line, yeah, which is very famous in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, or Google Hangout, whatever you want, whatever you like, and uh, whatever fits the most for you. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a decision you have to make with your tutor and uh, with your student. Maybe that's an answer. Um, we will look in future to organize it uh, in a more central way, yeah. Uh, but uh, at this moment, we are not able to organize it in a very different way. So let's look to the video. 
And uh, if there are more questions, Veronica, please tell me. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Arthur Kaufman at the University of New Mexico. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Community Health. Our state is large, it's rural, and it's quite poor, and we're on the U.S.-Mexican border. For the last 10 years, I've been uh, very interested in finding ways of addressing the social determinants of health, which include uh, housing, transportation, uh, food, um, social inclusion, education, income, all of those uh, elements which have a far more important role in health than does the health delivery system itself. And we've tried to find ways of addressing this through our health system. Uh, we found that community health workers are excellent at addressing social determinants, but is there a way of wedding their skills with this resource of the health system? So the objectives of this brief uh, talk will be to learn how a clinic-based community health worker can complement the role of the more traditional location of community health workers in our communities, uh, learn some unique skills that community health workers bring to health teams, and learn how to overcome some of the resistance uh, that may be put up when health systems uh, think of employing community health workers. Now, this uh, graph uh, tells a story that's very important to this topic. And if you look at the high-income countries, the OECD countries, um, what you find is they tend to spend about as much on health and social services as each other. The differences and why it's so important in the United States is that our country spends far more on medical services than it does on social services. And it's the social services component <clears throat> that has to do with how do we address all those social determinants. And it is a major explanation of why the United States, though it spends far more than any of the other uh, high-income countries on health, has by far the worst health outcomes. So we've learned from the use of community health workers in mostly Africa and Latin America and have been very impressed with not only their impact on health of communities, but they address social determinants. They are culturally, linguistically competent. They come from the community served and they seem to be incorporated much more into their health systems than we um, have them in the United States. But there are barriers that we found when we brought up the idea of incorporating them into the health system. Who are these people? Many administrators say yeah, they, they don't, they don't uh, have medical degrees or nursing degrees or pharmacy degrees. Isn't it a risk for us to have them work with patients? Um, hey, yeah, they work on the U.S.-Mexican border, but but it's not something that we're used to. And uh, even people who work in health systems, like, for example, social workers, are worried that we would be bringing them in to replace them, uh, a less expensive uh, worker. And even the community health workers themselves that have spent decades and decades working in communities very effectively are worried that we're going to appropriate them and uh, make them work in a medical model, which they find not consistent with the work they do with communities. So we have to find ways to overcome this resistance. So one of the things we did is thought about, could we learn from asking all of our patients that come into primary care, the major questions about their experience with the social determinants. These are 11 examples that we use. We created a, a social determinants prescription pad, and we have asked every single patient coming into family medicine and primary care at the university, 
and at the major network of community health centers in our area, these questions. And we've now asked about 50,000 patients, just all coming in, all not selected, just everyone that comes in, these same questions. And what I'm going to show you is the results of the first 3,000 patients we've seen, because the results from the 50,000 are exactly the same. And what it shows is that half of the patients we see have at least one adverse social determinant. And half of those have even more. Some have five or six adverse social determinants. And what's important is that the clinics themselves did not know this because they don't ask these questions. So this has had a profound influence on our services at the university and our neighboring network of community health centers, because now we have justification for hiring community health workers because these are the problems underlying some of the issues we see every day in our practices. So every clinic now has employed community health workers, and those community health workers have made a profound uh, impact on those clinics. Because one of the things we learned is they take complicated problems off the plate of providers. And even the social workers find that they are helped by having these almost extensions of the social services they provide. So it's a win-win uh, all around. The more important long-term impact is how it has influenced the leadership of our state in terms of the insurance companies and the large provider systems. In our state, about 40 to 50 percent of the population is on uh, Medicaid, a insurance company for those with a lower income. And now the state has mandated Every single insurance company that gets dollars from that system must invest in the employment of community health workers. And we find there is a four to one return on investment for managing patients with higher complex needs. And then we've also found that the cost for providing those services in primary care systems is greatly reduced when we add a community health worker to the health team. So in conclusion, we feel that we can enhance the impact of our health service system by incorporating community health workers onto the health team. Thank you very much. I'm muted, yeah. Um, I was talking to myself, yeah. Uh, so I would say thank you, Dr. Kaufman. Uh, what I find, what I find, the main message of this uh, this wonderful video is that uh, community community healthcare workers can add value, yeah, when we want to fight against the, the social determinants of health. Yeah? And it fits very well um, to our next assignments, yeah, because we want to. Um, receive information. We want to question um, healthcare providers, healthcare professionals in the community, and community healthcare workers as are one type of uh, healthcare providers, healthcare um, workers in the in the field. Yeah. Um, students in Belgium are not aware of what a community healthcare worker is, so they should look it up. Yeah, but I think a, a lot of the other students know very well what the community healthcare worker is. So it's a, it's a video on how you can create impact uh, by the work field yeah, and the members of a team. So a second video I want to show to you is... Uh, Tony? Yes? We have a question from Diego from Mexico. Yes. Uh, I was wondering if anyone can explain to me more about the labor that community workers do. I have problems understanding their role. Okay. Maybe he has to look it up and to connect with uh, a student from Belgium. Yeah, but uh, actually, um, 
a community healthcare worker is a, a healthcare professional yeah, that did not follow a course to become a nurse or to become a medicine. It actually started with volunteers who, works, who work uh, in the community and who are from the community yeah, uh, to, yeah, to strengthen that community and to support that community. Yeah? If uh, anyone of the experts in this, uh, in this meeting want to add something more yeah, to the definition, but uh, it's okay that he asked it what uh, it is uh, a community healthcare worker, yeah. because I was not aware that uh, Mexican students do not know what community work, healthcare workers are. Yeah. But uh, I will uh, look up uh, a definition of community healthcare workers and I will add it to the, to the PowerPoint presentation. Maybe that's easier for all the students, okay? Right. Let's continue with the second movie of Rabia Khan. Yeah, uh, she made a, a movie on how a population health lens do uh, health services. Enjoy the video. Hi, everyone. My name is Rabia Khan and I work at the George Institute for Global Health based in Sydney, Australia. I'm an um, epidemiologist and a public health specialist by trade and I've been working in population health for the last 20 years and that's why today I'll be talking about a population health lens to health services. I've worked in several countries. I've worked in New Zealand, in Australia, in England and more recently at the OECD in Paris. So what are we gonna to learn today? So over the next 10 to 15 minutes, I hope by the end of this session, you'll be able to define what population health means, recognize why it is important to health services, both at the clinical patient provider level, at the provider level and at the service level. And most importantly, learn how to apply a population health lens to the work you do every day especially in health services delivery. So what is population health? You will hear a lot of different definitions. If you Googled it, a lots of different definitions come up, lots of other words come up. The definition we are using for this session and the most common definition is, it's about the health outcomes of a group of individuals, as well as including the distribution of such outcomes within the group. So its main aim is at improving the health of the entire population and reducing inequities within this population. So we are interested in population groups. We are interested in not just the patient, but the community the patient lives in. So what's the difference between population health and medicine? One of the main differences is, as I mentioned, is population health deals with the health from the perspective of populations, while medicine deals with health from the perspective of individuals. So in this case, you may see a young child who's got the inhaler and is in a hospital and has had an asthma attack. So as a, when you're dealing in medicine or clinical care, you're interested, rightly so, in the care of this individual. You're thinking in terms of their symptoms, how to treat those symptoms, as well as how to prevent exacerbations of those symptoms when they leave the hospital. So that's a medical or a clinical approach. So in medicine, the patient is the individual person. You're interested in the patient. Whereas in population health, your patient is your community. It's your entire population. So with this asthma case, you look at each patient who comes in with that and you treat them. In population health, what we're interested in is, and what I look at is a lot, is how many patients are coming in with asthma exacerbations? Who are these patients? What is the age group? What are the gender? What kind of socioeconomic status? And also what time of the year? Now, I'm not sure if anyone's been up, um, it's middle of November here in Sydney and very recently, and we're in the midst of bushfire season. So this, sorry, this next picture is a view outside of my office at work. And as you can see, usually it is normally a clear blue sky in Sydney, but we've had bushfires, high temperatures, which have resulted in a lot of smog and a very heavy smoke. And what this resulted was 
that a lot of people with, especially with asthma, COPD, end up in emergency departments or also end up in hospitals and their asthma gets exacerbated or they're, um, they, get, they have symptoms like shortness of breath and they need the inhalers more. So whenever we have, when we know we're going to have a poor air quality day or bushfire day, the public health, the public health authorities in um, Sydney send out an alert via TV, via SMS, via, um, via um, social media to let people know that the air quality is poor, to use their inhalers, to prevent, um, to avoid going outside, to avoid exercising. So tips like that. So that's what a population health approach to an asthma visit to ED looks like. So one of the big things you would, whenever, if you look for population health, one of the other words that always comes up with population health are social determinants of health. And as you can see, this is an adaptation of a very famous framework from um, Dal Green and Whitehead from the 1970s, but it's been updated to reflect what our current situation is. So briefly, social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work and age. And they're shaped also by the distribution of money, power and resources at global, national and local levels. So going back to that example, so when we're looking at that child who's come into ED because of asthma exacerbation, you could be looking at just the people in terms of the age, the sex, hereditary factors. So has a child got a history of asthma? She is a, a female and she is under 10 years old in that picture. Sometimes then you have to look at the lifestyle as well in terms of any conditions. So the lifestyles would be things like um, diet, physical activity, work. So it could be is her how much exercise she's getting and things like that. Asthma is a bit different. Then you've got the community and the community includes for different people could be where they live, where they work in case of children, where the school is. So it could be if you were if you have this um, child coming into your clinic, you might want to know whether she lives close to a busy road, whether her school is close to a busy road. Then we're getting into the local economy and then and broader and broader and broader and with those bushfires, recently we've had a lot of debate about the link with the bushfires with climate change. So population health also involves itself with much broader global issues like climate, climate change. So what are the major determinants of health? And what we find is, and there's some links here to some pie charts here in, my, um, in, this, gra in this slide, and you don't need to read the exact details, but what they're trying to um, showcase is that socioeconomic and environmental determinants of health, when you combine them together, are responsible for a higher proportion of our health. They're much bigger part, and in some cases, almost half of the health of individuals and the population is determined by their socioeconomic status and the environment, where they live, where they work, how much they earn, um, which in terms of where they live, in terms of not only their community and neighborhood, but also their country. And this is then followed by health behaviors, healthcare, and then finally genetic and physiological factors. Now it's quite interesting because in most cases, healthcare, there've been lots and lots of studies and it varies from 10 to 20% of all health is determined by the healthcare system. So an 80%, 80 to 90% is outside of the healthcare system, our health. So to improve health, we have to focus as much on those factors that lie outside the healthcare systems as those, as, as those within it. And sometimes as health profession, healthcare professionals, we forget that a lot of times when a patient comes to us, there are a lot more issues outside, their, outside that um, visit that influences their health. So how do we apply a population health lens? So hopefully by now you're a bit clearer about what population health looks like, how it differs from a medical perspective, what are social determinants of health, but how do we put this together? Now this is a framework from the King's Fund, which I really like, because what it does is it lets us think through the activities and connections that are currently taking place that help us kind of link it up. So we would so at the moment and most times, all these four things sit separately, not only in 
pretty much almost every country, especially every country I've worked in, and there are very few times where they intersect. So you've got a, your health and care system, and hopefully it's integrated. In most countries, it's not, but that is one thing with, um, that helps in improving health. Then you've got your wider determinants of health. So these could be, these are your social environmental determinants. So these are income, working, work, um, and the built environment, as well as air quality and climate change, are the wider determinants of health. And then we have our health behaviors and lifestyles. So these are more the risk factors like obesity, smoking, physical activity. And then we have the places and communities we live in. So this is both your, where your patients live and where you live and, and also where you work, where you go to school. So these are the different communities. It's the built environment. So for example, with our patient with, a, with an asthma attack, we could be we could try to figure out why that patient's having an asthma attack. So generally, we diagnose symptoms. We know the patient is having an asthma attack, an asthma exacerbation. We provide the treatment. It could be an nebulizer or various um, or a different inhaler. So that is where the integrated health and care system comes in. Then we could see the places and communities where the, where our pay, where the child lives in with asthma. As I said, does a child live in a home that is very close to a busy road or goes to a school that's close to a busy road? How can we uh, mitigate that? Can we say, um, can we um, engage with our local community in terms of um, if it's near a school, that we shouldn't have busy roads near schools or maybe having a, where parents drop off it? by walking to school rather than driving to school. So that's the places and communities we live in. With the wider determinants of health, we might want to know whether the patient, she can afford, where her parents can afford her medicine and her medication. So that is one of the wider determinants is about affordability and about access. So this is what a population health lens looks like in that particular case. I'll give another example as we move on. So this is another example. And this is in one of the hospitals I worked. What we were finding was that 15% of readmissions, hospital readmissions, were people who were frail, they had multimorbidity, and were over 80 years of age. And what we were finding was that they weren't just coming back once in terms of a readmission. So they had come into hospital once, they've been discharged, and they were coming back quite frequently. So in some cases, 15% of readmissions this patient group would might come back three to five times a year to the hospital. And we were trying to figure out why were they coming to the hospital and not why they were not being looked after at the um, general practitioner level, at the primary care level, and also what could we do to reduce the readmissions, but more importantly, improve outcomes for these patients because nobody really wants to go to a hospital, especially when you're frail and you're over 80 years of age. So what we did was we did some, um, some po population health research to understand why these patients were ending up in hospital repeatedly in a year. And we found that one, a lot of things was not just the primary care, but it was their home environment and their social environment. So what we did as one of the interventions was enlisted community health workers, as well as social workers, who once a patient had been discharged, visited them at home to identify the opportunities and challenges and barriers these patients were having. So each patient was unique. And what we were finding was for a, there were some broad themes coming up, even though they had different diseases. So some had been in hospital for hip and knee hip replacement or bed sores, pressure ulcers. There were lots of different causes for why they were coming to the hospital, but the reasons were the same. So what we found were the main reasons for people coming in were they did not have enough food sometimes. They weren't getting enough food and nutrition. They were um, lonely. And also their homes were, haven't been, the homes were quite dangerous and were not safe places. And they were not, in the sense, they were dangerous because they hadn't been adapted to suit their needs. So these community health workers then visited the patient's homes to identify how we could help them from a healthcare point of view, but also from a life point of view. So some of the, for the patients who were lonely, 
we started a, a, group, a walking group for who were so to get some physical activity, but also some friendships, to form friendships, to have a group. We also then looked at their homes. What we were finding were some of their kitchens and bathrooms were not suited. So that's why they were having a lot of injuries. And sometimes it was a simple intervention as putting in a step ladder or just um, and, or just reducing the level um, the steps in their homes by having a, putting in a plank or putting in a plank so that they can just roll, um, so it's easier for them. And sometimes what we were finding with nutrition was that they were not getting, um, they were, they hadn't gotten their finances in order, and hence were not getting their benefits. Also, were not using their benefits in terms of getting home help. So that is something they are entitled to to get home help. Who somebody goes out, does the shopping for them, brings the shopping back, food shopping, prepares their food so that they're having a nutritious meal, as well as. Uh, as well as they have meals in their fridge so they don't have to wait till they have enough nutritious meals for a week. So we did all these interventions by applying a population health lens. So we could have just kept treating each person as they came in every day, uh, as they came in each time in the hospital. And that would have been, um, we could have kept doing that. But what we found by using a population health lens and identifying what were the broader determinants of their health, or in this case, their illness as well, and then um, intervening in terms of having community health workers and social workers visiting patients and helping them with their problems, we found that the patient's health improved, their outcomes improved, um, they reported that they were feeling much more settled and much more um, in control of their lives. And from the hospital point of view, our readmissions dropped in this cohort after six months of this initiative. So what we found was um, we were still having readmissions, but the readmissions of frail people with frail elderly people over 80 years of age who had multimorbidity had significantly dropped. And some of our patients who've been coming three to six times a year were now coming only once or twice a year. So I hope that has given you a taste of what applying a population health lens looks like. And I like this analogy. And if you, um, if you read more about population health, you'll find this analogy a lot of times. And what it is, it's about a cliff, a very steep cliff. And it likens that a lot of our medical care, a lot of our health care is more about, is focused on the bottom of the cliff. When people have fallen off the cliff, we have an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. And that is where a lot of times healthcare and health professionals intervene when people are already sick and they are at the bottom of the cliff. And what Population Health Lens is about is preventing people from falling off that cliff by building a fence up at the top of the cliff so people don't have to enter the healthcare system. So in this, in our two examples in today's presentation, in terms of, um, in the first case with a young patient with asthma, exacerbate, asthma exacerbation, if we looked at the broader determinants like air quality, as well as even broader climate change, um, and where, how's where we, where we situate, where our schools are built and where they're situated, those kind of things are about building a fence and moving people back from the edge of the cliff. In case of our um, elderly patient. A multimorbid a patient who's over 80 years of age and is multimorbid, those kind of interventions are helping them, again, building a fence so that they don't have to keep falling off the cliff and coming into the hospital. So I think that, to me, is one of the really, one of the main reasons why population health is important to health services, because it allows us to see our patients in a much broader view and seeing them as part of a community and not as a disease or not as a symptom, but more as a person. And I hope you've, um, you'll be able to apply this population health lens to your work. And this has been a useful way to look at your day-to-day -day work and how you could apply a population health lens to what you do. And if you are interested in knowing more about this, I have um, at the end of the, on this slide, I've got three uh, publications which I have found very useful in the past, which are, which are more about how more the practical side of things on how do we take 
social determinants of health and a population health approach and how do we actually implement it in our daily practice, be it as healthcare professionals, as policymakers, as communities, or as um, citizens. Thank you. I want to thank Rebia for uh, her wonderful tutorial on uh, having a broad lens yeah, and having an, uh, um, a broader view to look to the community. And that's also what we want to establish with this uh, ISTEP program. We want to uh, let you experience and to um, let you uh, look to the community from different angles and prevent people falling off the cliff uh, in your own community by through observation. Okay, so this is almost the end. Yeah, I will now introduce you to the the next assignment. Yeah, so I already told you that the assignment uh, is on um, on um, oh, yeah on work environment and the problems uh, that has to do with that, yeah. So the next um, assignment, what you will have to do is you have to conduct an interview. Yeah? And uh, you have to conduct an interview. And what is an interview? Uh, we generally uh, use it as a qualitative research technique. Uh, this is not a research, it's just a way to, to collect your data yeah? and to engage with your community um, and to go into the community and to ask some questions to your community as such as. Yeah? So what do we really expect from this assignment? Yeah, we want you to go into the community and to answer a question. Yeah? And uh, I describe it over here as a research question. Yeah? So I want you to answer this question. In what way do you experience as a healthcare worker that employment conditions affect the quality of life of your clients or patients? Yeah. So uh, I'm using clients because I'm, I'm looking also to uh, social services and patients uh, because we have to look wider than uh, only the medical um, aspect. Of it. If you want to know how social determinants are related to, um, um, to the employment conditions. I found a wonderful article. Uh, that's the link over there in the PowerPoint. You can download it and read it. Yeah, and you will have some idea on how it works. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Uh, this is again the model we use. Yeah, and also uh, Rania told us about the model. It's all so the model she used in her. Um, so look at the model and try to understand the model and use the model to design your questions uh, for, to answer the research question. Yeah? So use this model to look uh, and to design the questions you have to ask yeah, to answer the research question. Right? Yeah. So how do you actually do it? Uh, how do you conduct an interview? And there's a lot of literature on how you design and how you um, actually do an, an, an interview, but over here you have some uh, yeah, helpful uh, ideas. We first want you to find a healthcare worker yeah, in your community yeah, for an interview or for this interview, and you have to make an appointment with this healthcare worker. Yeah? You can do it by cell phone, you can do it by Zoom, by Teams, whatever you want. Uh, I know some of the students are in confinement or in lockdown, yeah, so they cannot uh, leave the house. But there are several ways to get in touch with uh, people from the community and uh, also uh, healthcare workers. Yeah. Then we want you to prepare specific pre-written and relevant questions for your interviewee related to the research questions above. So I already mentioned what the research question was. Yeah. So that's the question I want to see answered at the end of this assignment. Yeah. And you prepare the questions. Yeah. So you can reflect on the, uh, on the questions. You can rethink the questions. Yeah. You can restructure the questions and uh, you write them down. Yeah, because otherwise you will forget your questions yeah, when you are doing the interview. Yeah? And then um, to do this, I already told you, you use the model of Darwin and White Red model. Okay? 
And then when you meet the interviewee, when you meet the healthcare professional of your community, you have the, an appointment with, uh, you listen actively and intentionally. Yeah? Uh, so you really understand what the message is uh, uh, of your uh, interviewee. Yeah? And you take notes yeah? or you ask uh, at, uh, if you are allowed to record the, the session uh, by Zoom or by a cell phone, whatever. Of, yeah, and then you can re-listen uh, to the interview. Yeah, and then what the actual assignment is, and that's the assignment you have to send to your tutor or to your teacher, is that you make a brief summary yeah, of one page yeah, of the main messages you received from your interviewee. So what are the most important messages uh, the person from the community, the healthcare worker in the community, um, yeah, gave to you to answer the question. That's the whole idea of the uh, of of the assignment. And maybe you have to come back on the community healthcare workers. If you have community healthcare workers, maybe it's interesting to invite or to interview a community healthcare worker because. Uh, little is known about the role of community healthcare workers and on how important community healthcare workers are. Uh, and Arthur Kaufman already told that they are very important if we have to deal with social determinants of health. Yeah, but it's always also a way to teach your other students, yeah, the students of your team who are not very familiar with community healthcare workers, uh, to teach them what they really are and what they can mean in, for a community. Because if there is something I've learned from my intercultural and international experiences is it that community healthcare workers are very worthful. Yeah? They're doing a great job. Yeah? And uh, in Belgium, they start to realize that they are important. So they start to uh, implement to, and to involve community healthcare workers in the community. So thank you. Okay, so this is the end. Yeah? So the end is near, uh, as we say, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, we know there are some problems uh, we try to solve in the next week. Yeah, we also know that some students did not interact with their tutors because students were not attending. Uh, we, will, we would like to uh, solve that problem. And we are also aware that some tutors did not respond uh, or did not take responsibility in, in this uh, ISTEP program. So we will have some discussions with uh, all stakeholders in the next week to, um, yeah, to fine tune the ISTEP program. Uh, and if you have questions, if you uh, experience problems, yeah, Please uh, involve your tutors yeah? uh, and please involve us. Yeah? We know um, you have a lot to deal with, yeah? but this is such a kind and wonderful experience we want you to offer. So we will do everything to succeed. Okay? So we will see you again in December for the next Sorry. meeting. Yes, a question, 10 questions. There is a question from Mustafa from Nigeria. Yeah. Um, he's asking if we can. Uh, interview more than one person of course you can do that yeah uh, yeah you're welcome to interview two or three persons also yeah but uh, I thought let's start with one yeah uh, for some students that's enough yeah but uh, yeah you have always students who want something more uh, who can give some more energy for an assignment so thank you Mustafa for doing that yeah um, Okay, more questions, Veronica? Um, not that I see, but maybe if I can add something. Yes, of course. Um, yeah, just to make sure that uh, I hope all students already are in the big WhatsApp group, because that's going to be the easiest way for us all to communicate. Um, so if you are not, please send a message right now so um, with your phone number so I can add you. Um, or I'll send you the link or something. So, and then uh, make sure that you're getting the emails and make sure to check your spam boxes um, to, um, to be included. Oh, I see, Maya, you said your phone number, but I need a, I need a regional code as well, plus zero one, plus, plus one, perfect. All right, that was all, thank you. Okay.
thank you to everyone. Have a good night, good afternoon, and a good day wherever you are and stay safe. Bye.